I really like creating, but it is a lot of work. And one thing that I have noticed is that um, companies and um, even industries do not fully understand the potential of sonic branding. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. This is the first part of my interview with Gina Isham. My next guest has over 20 years of audio experience. She started in film composition and production music and evolved into the world of sonic branding and sound identities as a creator, strategist, and thought leader. Her company, Dreamer Productions, creates audio identities for companies and brands, as well as consults and educates brands and marketers on sound and marketing and its best practices. She produces, hosts, and edits the Sound and Marketing podcast. She also teaches courses on the fundamentals of sound and marketing. Dreamer Productions is a part of Stage Ham Entertainment, LLC, a full-service audio-video production company based out of Pasadena, California. Her name is Gina Isham, and just part of the reason I wanted her on the show is that she's right there in the thick of things, creating and consulting to help people understand how powerful a strategic and intentional audio brand can really be. Besides that, she's just a great person doing great things, and that's something you need to know about. Thank you so much for joining me today, Gina. I'm looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to it for a while, actually. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, Jody. I'm excited. Um, I wanted to start out by kind of setting the scene for everyone because I've been starting to ask this for a lot of uh, uh, guest interviews that I've been doing, and it gets some really interesting answers. So I'm curious as to what you're going to say. Do you have an early memory of sound that mer that moved you? Something in particular that maybe got you interested in the whole thing? Um, well, not interested in the whole thing per se. I think that's just my love of music and I would just get so emotionally connected to music. It makes sense that that's where I went. But an early, um, an early sound that I remember is, uh, my grandmother had a house in central Illinois and I would go there in the summertime and, uh, the sound of cicadas Oh yes. make me so happy. And people who know what cicadas sound like, they're like, that's so weird because they are so loud. <laughs> yes. Like you literally, I, I have memories of sitting on my grandma's back porch, sipping iced tea and yelling over the cicadas, talking to people. And it is wow. one of my happiest. It's my happy place. That sure. is my happy place. And uh, anyone that doesn't know what a cicada is, they are these ugly bugs that live underground for 17 years and they come out once to mate and then they die. And they're, they're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> really for are. for some reason. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it, it always just happened that you know, pretty much every summer there was some of the, the cicadas that were coming out and they would just be making all these sounds. And the, and the sounds are probably mating sounds. I have no idea. But I just love I love that sound. Well, it's the sound of summer, you know, mm -hmm. and, you and know. of my grandmother. And if, yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a wonderful memory. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when when I think of summer, a lot of it has to do with that kind of a, a cicada call or or um, I guess um, grasshoppers don't quite make the same sound, but they they do make because uh, their legs kind of uh, scratch together. Yeah, but I'm not I can't remember the sound that they make, but they do make a sound. Yeah, and I think that would be more in night at the night. Yes, probably. So yeah, I have I have memories of of like grasshopper sounds at night, which I kind of mm -hmm. yeah. So sort of the same thing, but a little mm -hmm. different. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great, and and. The really interesting thing about that is how powerful it is, because I guess every time you hear the cicadas now, it brings you back to that moment. Yes, it absolutely does. Yeah, absolutely. That's so great. So moving on from there, <laughs> what happened to get you into this whole AI voice audio branding thing? Because I got to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a degree in music composition. I'm a composer. Uh, originally, um, before I went off for my degree, I wanted to be the next Sarah McLaughlin. Uh, okay. And that didn't happen at all because uh, I found out really fast I'm not a performer. 
uh, I get it all in my head and I get really anxious and I don't eat for a long time and I'm overanalyzing everything. And then I get on stage and I have fun and it's, I, I think I'm pretty good. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And, but as soon as I get off stage, then I'm criticizing all the the mistakes I made. And then I'm thinking about the next gig. Um, like how am I going to make that better? And I can't believe I did this. And then I stop (laughs) eating again. And so (laughs) oh, that's stressful. I I gave that up. I Uh gave that up. Um, that did not go past college. Um, but I realized really fast that writing, I loved writing and I loved to create this, um, emotional connection that I always had with music, um, growing up. I mean, there are certain songs that I hear in the radio and I'm like flashback to high school, (laughs) like, uh, 1979 smashing pumpkins. I, I immediately go back to summertime Mm -hmm. in my friend's car, just driving around, like cruising around with my friends, blaring it in the, in the speakers. But uh, to create something that emotional, I really, really, I really dug it. And I got off of the songwriter part of it and went more towards instrumental. Um, I can write lyrics, but it's very hard. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I really um, bonded a lot better with instrumentals and the actual melodic elements of it. So I got my degree in composition and then... uh, I graduated and went into, you know, the nine to five job working admin because I couldn't figure out how to get a job with music. Uh, And then I just kind of, (laughs) yeah, it's very, very hard. So many, many years of that being a side hustle. Um, And then I found my way into production music and started writing production music for uh, like, for those of you that don't know what production music is, it's all of that music that's jam packed into any like reality TV or talk show or whatever. Like if you listen to it, my cue sheets, I would get like a 10 second, uh, needle drop and my cue sheets would be like 10 pages long with all the songs, the instrumentals and the, and the lyrical songs that would be placed in one episode, like a 30 minute episode of something. Wow. It was insane. Um, so I started with that and then I got kind of over it because I wasn't given a specific, write this, this is what they're looking for. It was more write something like toddlers and tiaras or duck dynasty or, um, oh gosh, (laughs) spacing all of them now, but it was more just pad your library with stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm so much better with deadlines and specific requests. Sure. And so it was very, very frustrating. And I always saw it. I was like, well, next year it's going to be the Kardashians, you know, like it's always (laughs) another show. And Mm -hmm. so I spend all this time writing all this music to fit a show that's going to be over the next year. And it's, it's another show that you're trying to do. And I remember specifically, uh, when like Skrillex came out and then it was just right Skrillex. I'm like, this is not going to last. I'm not even going to go this direction. <laughs> but like, that's all that people were looking for. And mm-hmm. I saw it. And I was like, this is going to tank. Like people are just going to stop looking for this. And then I've got all this music that nobody's going to want. And it happened. You know, I, I didn't write like Skrillex because I knew that would happen. And mm-hmm. it did. So I got really frustrated. And then just by accident, I got into working with companies and they'd give me these, um, these specs of what they were looking for. And my drafts were passing. They, they wanted my draft and I was reading it really, really well. And I really liked it a lot because they were looking for specifically what I could write and what I could come up with to tell the story of their brand. So. I guess the the way that I like to put it is it's not really my vision. Um, it's my my skill to create something, but I want to personify that company or that brand or that product mm-hmm. um, by listening to what they're looking for, uh, doing my research and my intent and producing something for them. So it's not about me. It's about them. And I, I find something really fulfilling about doing that. I know that we're all dealing with a lot these days, so I really wanted to acknowledge those that have gone out of their way to leave an honest review of this podcast. Like Sargent, who writes, Healing with Sound. This episode is so good. I'm glad that Jody featured this topic on her show. I've been really wanting to learn more about healing with sound. 
Thanks, Sergeant. That's definitely a topic I'm interested in, and I'm sure there will be more episodes about it in the future. I really appreciate your listening. And for those of you that are interested, you can also leave a voice review now off of the main podcast page. It's super simple and fun, and I'd love to hear what you think. Now back to the show. It sounds like that's how you kind of got led into the whole audio branding thing. Mm -hmm. So so now that you were working with these companies, giving them the music that they wanted, when did that expand? Like what what happened there? Yeah, um, I really like creating, but it is a lot of work. And one thing that I have noticed is that um, companies and um, even industries do not fully understand the potential of sonic branding. The term itself is not understood. And um, somewhere along the line, I started to really delve into what were people calling sonic branding. Yeah. And a lot of times it was a jingle, which a jingle can be part of sonic branding, mm -hmm. but its first initial intent is to take care of a campaign, which is not the company. It's a specific uh, maybe a product launch or uh, just a commercial campaign that's going on. So a jingle is created for one piece of work. It's not necessarily created for the company. Mm -hmm. A jingle can land really, really well and become sonic branding. But the original intent is not that nine times out of 10. Um, so I was just finding out that people were not realizing the full potential of what they were doing. and then. In all of my rabbit hole uh, searching that I do, I was finding out more about sound and healing and voice tech and smart technology, sensory marketing, um, data science, psychology, mm -hmm. uh, anthro anthropology, like all of this stuff. And what it all whittled down to is it's not about music. It's about sound. Mm -hmm. And when you take that limitation out of the mix, and think, oh, I just need a song. And then you think, oh, it's a sound. It might come across as daunting, but the way I see it is it's liberating because now you have so much more that you can play with. And uh, one of the things that I touch on in my course is that sound, if you break it down and you really think about it, sound has been with us from the very beginning. Sound is created by vibrations and vibration is movement. And so as long as there has been movement, there has been sound. So regardless of what you believe the beginning of time is, sound has been there since the beginning of time. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, what's more us then than sound, you know, and taking smart technology into the equation, people are not looking at a screen. They're hearing things. So how do you present yourself? when you don't have that visual in front of you. And one of the ways that you do is one of the five senses. We are so fixated on focusing on one sense, visual, that we are not seeing the other four that, mm -hmm. that we have at our beck and call. And sound is one of them. And, uh, you know, there's, there's people that say voice first, voice only. I see voice as an enhancement. So even if you have the best, um, the best visual advertising, the best visual marketing campaign, sound is not going to hurt that. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to complement it and enhance it. If you ignore the sound that is already in your brand, you will actually be hurting. It will be, uh, it will not be an asset. It will be a detriment to you. So it is imperative that you pay pay attention. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Getting more into the sensory marketing idea of this, out of curiosity, I know that visual and um, the the audio uh, audio audible components of the, these are very important. Have you seen people use other sensory uh, uh, parts to particular campaigns and be successful with that? Yeah, actually, I just interviewed for for my podcast, the Sound and Marketing Podcast. I interviewed um, the team at. Pandora Studio Resonant, and they yep. just recently did at the end of last year a campaign for Dove, and they had a line of like body wash and I think bubble bath or something like that. And it was mango scented. And um, what they wanted to create was an escape 
So we're stuck in COVID. We can't go to <laughs> yes. that tropical island that yeah. we've been fantasizing about. And so they said that this would be uh, a sound escape instead of a, an escape to the actual Caribbean or wherever you think of a tropical place. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they worked with Dove and created a playlist of tropical, um, you know, mood enhancing music. So they focused on this experience that you could have while in your bath. And the thing that I really, really liked about this is they actually incorporated four of the five senses. And I got super excited because I haven't come across uh, very many uh, campaigns that had so many of the senses heightened. And so mm -hmm. it was very, very exciting because they had sound, because they had the playlist that you were listening to, sight, because the bubbles and the packaging and all of that stuff, touch, because you're feeling the bubbles. Of course. Um, smell, because they all smell, all mm -hmm. of the bath stuff smell, and potentially taste if you accidentally, you know, take well, some in. <laughs> maybe you, you know, cut up some mango and have it in the bath. <laughs> hey, there you go. They didn't put that part of that, but maybe they should have. Maybe but they're, they should have. Um, <laughs> Their results just in the first couple of months of it running were really, really great. And I'm excited to find out what their up updated stats were for the next several months. But uh, it was very, very highly received. And they even um, made it so that the playlists would actually be the length of a bath so that you could <laughs> so that you could experience the whole thing. What a great idea. I love it. Are you looking for ways to improve your company's or podcast's impact? You'd be surprised how powerful the use of an intentional audio branding strategy can be. Want to know more? I have a free downloadable PDF that gives you my five tips for implementing an intentional audio strategy at voiceoversandvocals.com slash audio dash branding dash strategy. That location does ask to put you on a mailing list just to send you updates on when the new podcasts come out. But if you really don't want to give your email out, I understand. Just contact me directly. My email is all over my website. And I'll make sure you get that PDF without needing to sign up anywhere. If you do sign up, though, you also get access to a resources section called The Studio, where I have videos, white papers and PDFs, discounts from my guests, and snippets of audio from my guests that no one else gets to hear. So maybe it's worth your while. Totally up to you. And of course, if you're looking for voiceovers, you can get in touch with me about that too. Now, back to the podcast. So there are so many things that could happen for such a campaign, so much potential. I, I'm really interested to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. my, my curiosity becomes, though, that I know that a lot of big companies are doing this, but do you think that it would be prohibit prohibitively expensive for a smaller company to do something in along those veins or even just audio branding. A lot of people think that it's too expensive for the smaller guys to manage. So I don't know if you have any suggestions for people who maybe are a little smaller than, say, McDonald's or Dove. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that the power of sound is that it is accessible uh, and attainable to all of us, brands both big and small. Um, it has a, a much lower um, point of entry. Yes, you could do a whole sonic branding package, but maybe you don't need that right now. Maybe all you need is to build a skill, you know, to do an Alexa skill or um, is it a Google action? Uh, just to, to put that in there and to get your voice out into smart technology. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, taking out the the idea of it being music should be a liberating thing because um, maybe it's just finding a new voiceover um, mask or not mascot. I'm not sure what the word would be, but like <laughs> spokesperson. Spokesperson. Thank you. Gosh, sorry, Jody. I just called you a mascot. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I, you know, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Whatever anyone wants to call it. <laughs> A spokesperson. I'm so sorry. Um, but maybe, maybe they're, they're, maybe they, they have a spokesperson and it's not landing and they just need to decide on different representation. Or maybe they don't have a spokesperson yet and um, they just need to start writing some script and coming up with some really cool radio advertisement. I would say almost that um, as far as like a, a voice is concerned, you're almost looking at 
uh, a representative sound for your voice as opposed mm-hmm. to a spokesperson. You know, mm-hmm. it 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 may be a little looser than that. Mm-hmm. You know what I yeah. mean? Like like it could just true. be uh, the sound of a particular voice works for that particular company. It could be multiple people. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's just a, a way that people talk about your brand and that you want people to talk about your brand. Mm-hmm. And that voice talks about your brand in that way. Yeah. So, yeah, there's lots of different things. Yeah. But but beyond the voice, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. There's... Well, uh, this is kind of a more obscure thought. And I, I kind of talk about this in um, in one of my lessons for my course is that. Uh, you could even think even more outside the box. So for example, uh, say you own a coffee shop and you curate your own Spotify playlist and you decide what are the sounds that are most uh, complementary to the experience of sitting in that coffee shop, right? So for example, for me, I think of a coffee shop. I don't think of rock and roll music necessarily. I think of classical music, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. But all coffee shops are different. So I think say, of jazz. Jazz. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so let's definitely. say, let's say, for example, this coffee shop jazz would be what uh, would be best represented for their their company, for their experience, for people that came in. Um, it would need to not necessarily be that coffee shop owner's taste in music, mm-hmm. but what do the patrons, what are the patrons interested in? Develop a playlist that would go alongside that. And when they come in and they they have their laptop or their book or however they're going to spend their time in the coffee shop and you've got a little sign saying find us on Spotify, here's our playlist. So they de- they they get the playlist on their phone um or so they're listening to the music and they go, "Oh, I really really like this music." When they're ready to go for the end of the day, they make note of this playlist and go, "Oh, I'm going to bring this back up at home." So now they finish their work or they finish their day, they decide to, to do this playlist. Potentially, they could be associating your coffee shop with this playlist experience that they are experiencing not even at your coffee shop. Mm-hmm. They may not even be having your coffee or your food at that moment. But if it was a pleasurable experience and it was strong enough of an experience, then you are advertising to your customer without having to be present. That's power. And it I know, is. I know yeah. we're talking about music in this, in this scenario, but it's non-traditional marketing, I guess mm-hmm. you would have to say. Sure. It's yeah. more like a product recognition through association. Yeah. And that association happens over time and, and with consistency, I guess. Mm-hmm. So as the uh, coffee shop continues to do that, I imagine that the people who are regulars will start to recognize that music and associate it with the coffee shop like you were saying and then they could take it home with them if they wanted to which yeah I love that that's a great idea I was always really impressed with how Starbucks did that kind of thing because Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been in uh, well it's been a while that I've been in a Starbucks (laughs) but the last time that I was in a Starbucks what they had was independent music and Mm -hmm. they would have the cover of the album like the CD or whatever on the on the um on the shelf for, you know, right next to the cash register where you're paying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then if you like the music, you could either like get it on Spotify or get it wherever you get your music or, you you know, originally, I guess you could actually buy a CD. I don't know how many people do that anymore. I know, not very many. <laughs> not very many, exactly. But the idea that Starbucks was kind of associating itself with independent musicians and sort of promoting them at the same time that they were you know, being, I guess, trying to tell people that they were like, you know, the the independent down home kind of people. Right. right? Like right. like Starbucks is. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mom and pop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was an interesting take on it just to sort of get that feel from them when you're going into a Starbucks. Because otherwise, I think you wouldn't get that feel at all. <laughs> That's true. That's true. This has been part one of our interview. I hope you'll tune in next week for part two. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.